the following 10 endoc endocrine disruptors are the main ones you should completely avoid. One, organo organophosphate pesticides. Two, 17A ethanol lestradiol. Number three, fire retardants, PBDEs. Number four, phthalates, five BPA. Six, percolite, per percolorite. Number seven, arsenic. Number eight, perfluorinated chemicals, PFCs. Number nine, mercury. Number 10, dioxin. Now, it seems like the obvious reason that people are saying, okay, whatever, sounds bad, but no big deal, is because they're not connecting it. With cigarettes, they think, oh, you smoke cigarettes, this is the result, I don't want that. But when I read this list, a lot of people are thinking like, you know, whatever, my dad's 80, my uncle would live to 86, this can't be that big a deal. So why do you think that these things are a big deal and the general public is still not connecting them to their health, the way they do cigarettes? <clears throat> <laughs> I, because I think uh, all these chemicals are just preserving us beautifully. We're all like, <laughs> we're like walking. Including our brains. <laughs> we're embalmed, yes. Uh, I, I really don't know what to say to that. I, I, I really have no answer to that, so I'm going to pass it on. I don't know why that argument seems, you know, that always comes up. If we have so many chemicals, why are we all living so long? I mean, one answer is that we're really good at keeping people alive who are sick. I mean, one thing that medicine has been able to do is keep you breathing. Yeah. So we've got a lot of chemicals and we're all getting sick, but they can keep us alive. And I guess that means our, you know, our, our longevity is fine, but our quality of life is maybe not so fine. Um, so I, I think maybe I'll leave it to the medical experts to answer that more satisfactorily. It takes uh, three generations to change a system. So. If this person is 80 and they look fine and they're living a long life, their lifestyle and their pollution that they have helped to create and that they've been living through, this is going to take the third generation to pay the price for that. So, you know, we are not, we can't go back and say that anymore that these people lived long. And, um, you know, they lived well and they could smoke and they could eat meat and they could drink coffee and alcohol and, you know, live it up. Well, one generation can live it up and then the third pays. And that's exactly where we are at. And if you work like Brian and I and every day sit with people that are getting younger and younger with every disease, for example, Crohn's and colitis, IBS, gastrointestinal problems. Usually, kids would be in their 20s when they would come to us. Now they're between 11 and 13. So it really dipped down. Cancer used to be, yeah, 60, 70, 80. That was kind of the norm that they would hit. And now it hits at three, three years old, 10 years old. So. That's the generation that ha that's paying for it. So, you know, there's the, it's a false um, um, f place that we think that because we look at our grandparents that they live that way and this is how old they got and they were, they were pretty healthy and uh, they might not remember anything, <laughs> you know, but they, uh, they lived kind of a healthy life. It's the third generation, and it will take three generations to fix this. So whatever we can do now, our great-grandkids will have the benefit of what we can do. Yeah, and I actually challenge uh, dynamically the premise that we live longer today. I challenge that premise. Uh, how they came up with that st statistic is modern medicine has done a lot of good and one of the things they did is they developed diagnostic tools where we can see a baby's breached, turned in the wrong direction, or an umbilical cord is wrapped around the neck. So we have virtually, not literally, wiped out infant mortality in the developed countries of the world. Now, in rich countries like the United States, we should be ashamed because in the poorest inner cities, we still have a high rate of infant mortality death at birth or before they're one. So if you take the idea that two to three children out of 10 would die at infancy and wipe that out 
and people used to live to 100, well, we get to 50 at that point. We move it up to 60, we move it up to 70, and they're saying we live to 70-some years old. We take out contagious diseases. Modern medicine has helped us with that. And it's not only modern medicine, it's st sterilization, that we're living in a much more sterile condition. Although you do get healthy bacteria, and the sickest people from bacteria and viruses in the world are the Japanese, because they're sterile nuts. You need a little bit of dirt in your life, but at least we don't have the kind of dirt and sewage systems that we had a century or two ago. And so we've wiped out a lot of that uh, nonsense that went on, unnecessary death. But in developing countries today, they're still dying, Most, the vast majority of people in the world still die today from waterborne diseases. So microbes, bacteria, or amoebas, or parasites they find in the water systems. Uh, the most important place you get chemistry is air, oxygen, 70% of pollutants in major cities probably come from what you breathe. And the environmental protection agencies here in this nation and around the world all report the same number, that the average household inside of the house is six to seven times more polluted than outside. So on hot, polluted days when I'm in major cities around the, the globe and they're saying the elderly and the young stay inside, I'm saying, please don't. Because as bad as, it, bad as it is outside, it's worse inside of your home. Uh, the last thing I want to address is one of the ways that we may, because people love sex, you know, out of all the books I've read, uh, written over the years and lectures I've done, uh, the one that was the most popular is a book we wrote on sex. And it doesn't tell you how to pick up boys or girls, so don't buy it for that reason. But it talks about the healthy part of sex. So let's give you one way that maybe we're going to start addressing chemicals to human health. Our sex, sexuality is changing because of all the plastics and all the pharmaceutical drugs and all the chemicals and all that we've talked about and all the statistics that, that Stephen is uh, perpetually throwing at you out there today. Literally, boys are becoming like girls and girls are becoming like boys. And the canary in that coal mine is the fact that one third of our young married couples cannot have children. But I won't challenge anyone here sitting in front of me in this room, but have you ladies who are single notice it's really hard to find men men now? And why? Because all of those chemicals are estrogen-like. And when women get extra estrogen, your body produces extra testosterone. So if you men are having a hard time finding a very feminine, loving woman, that's why. She's barking at you today. So maybe the one issue we can get people to awaken about chemicals and heavy metals and pollutants is we say, by the way, you won't have good sex anymore. And if we say that, quite possibly people will say, oh, we better do something about this. Forget the fact we'll get every disease known to man. <laughs> um, we've been speaking on the effect that chemicals have on us personally, but aside from on human health, what are the consequences of all these chemicals in our environment? What are the effects that are, that are taking place from all of them? Uh, we could spend a lot of time on this question. Um, I'll just give you one example. Um, I was in the Pacific Northwest a couple of summers ago. Uh, we were kayaking out with a whole pot of orcas uh, off of the coast of Seattle. And the word was coming out about how uh, these flame retardants, which we, we have been talking so much about, uh, as many of you probably know, they are fat soluble. So you, when you have flame retardants in your body, you don't pee them out. They accumulate in your fat cells. Um, so one way, one vector that you get flame retardants is by eating fatty food, because the flame retardants happen to accumulate in fat. So there are doctors, for example, that can go into a supermarket and they'll take the fatty foods like butter and they'll test it to see if there's you know, prevalent flame retardants there, and they will always find it. Uh, another place they often find it is in fatty fish. So salmon, for example, has a lot of fat in it, and you find a lot of uh, flame retardants in salmon. Well, in this particular part of the Northwest, the only thing that these so-called resident pods of orcas eat are Chinook salmon. Mm. That's it. They don't eat people, which is <coughs> why I was kayaking there, and an orca surfaced. I was in a boat with my 
then nine-year-old daughter and an orca surfaced eight feet from our kayak. Uh, eight feet, this, this whale was as big as a subway car and there bubbled up to the surface right next to us. When we recovered from that moment, uh, I was started thinking about this. Uh, so an orca doesn't eat people, it doesn't eat seals, it doesn't eat, it eats one thing, salmon. And an orca eats something like 150 pounds of Chinook salmon every single day. The Chinook salmon are, have a lot of fat, which means they have a lot of flame retardants, which means as, it, as this stuff bioaccumulates up the food chain, orcas, like lots of other whales, are getting flame retardants, which is to say they are getting things like breast cancer. So they have tested whales, orcas, beluga whales up in the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, they, whales are developing breast cancer now. Now why is that? It's the same reason that other mammals like humans are getting breast cancer, because these fat soluble carcinogens are circulating the globe. So that's just one of countless examples of the way biomagnification and ecological food webs interact and this stuff gets in the air, gets in the water, and that means everything is getting it. It's not just us. We make it, but we're not the only things that absorb it. Well, you can see what uh, genetic manipulated foods do to our wildlife. And, uh, you know, uh, elks are just uh, up in uh, Minnesota is just falling dead. And without showing that they were sick for, for a long time, they're just dying. And there's, uh, you know, when they look at monarch butterflies, because they're often used when you want to check environmental pollutants. And they just, it's horrendous right now how few monarch butterflies we have. And um, like we talked about bees, I mean, without bees, we won't be here. <laughs> we won't be here. And we got to start planting um, flowers and plants that bees will really love. And, and so we can't go out and change the whole world. As a person, change your lifestyle and start to take care of what's, what you can do. And you can plant these plants that they will be attracted to the same as um, monarch butterflies too, because they, pol they pollinate the plants. And without, without monarch butterflies, without bees, we, we won't be here too long. So, you know, start to take care of yourself, the clothes you wear, what you eat, what you choose, because you really, really have a choice. And, um, you know, that's all you need to do, because you will be an example. And that's the most important. Do what makes you happy, because what makes you happy, if you're really truthful to yourself, will make the planet healthy. You know, when you, when you think about this in a, in a very large scale way, um, we need to immediately act. This is not one of those issues you can put on the back burner and say, let somebody else handle this. Uh, we've created it, so take responsibility. Uh, the old term which I love, reap what you sow. And that's not only biblical, it's common sense. And so I admit that I've been part of that problem and I'm still part of that problem. I sit here and arrogantly tell you I'm above the fray and maybe a little bit. But we still participate in this. All of us participate in this. So as Anna Maria and all of us have said tonight is do what you can do. And don't let this overwhelm you. And through your small action, all of us, imagine if seven billion of us tomorrow said, we're not going to eat anything but organic food. Do you know what a revolution that would be on changing the chemicals? Do you realize 25% of pesticides are used on growing cotton? We're not talking about unnatural chemical-made fibers. We're talking cotton, 25% of the pesticides are used on that. Imagine if we say we're only going to use organic clothing. Now, what I've just said to you, if, if that could happen, if we had a magic wand and we did this, you know we would wipe out 35 to 40% of the chemicals on the planet from those two acts? Those two acts. Then imagine we say, this gentleman 
who passionately stood up here and said, they've created a plastic that's not toxic. If we said, the next car I buy, I refuse to buy the car if you have petrochemical plastic in it. But you have to make it out of that plastic. You know, I happen to be one who tries to use vehicles that are socially conscious. But that car that's social, very socially conscious that I own now, guess what? That has plastic in it. So maybe I'm going to write this. I just thought about that now. I'm going to write it to that car manufacturer, an American car manufacturer, and say, you know, I have, I have a microphone and I have a voice worldwide and I'm going to start telling people, you have the best technology today, but guess what? If you don't start to put, you know, plant-based plastics into that car, I'm going to also let them know that. And so these are the things that we have to do. Um, you know, it's funny, years ago, you know, we always pride ourselves on being way up green at Hippocrates. And years ago, we had been buying stainless steel bottles for years. And somehow, in all of the travels, I travel sometimes 200 days a year, they started to ship in something that looked like stainless, stainless steel. And two of our guests came to us and said, this is made out of aluminum. And I had this argument, and I was saying, no, no, we have stainless steel. So you've got to be diligent with this stuff, too. Just because you made a choice two years or ten years ago, keep on top of it, because things go south on you sometimes. And companies change. And one of the, the problems I see is when these natural companies who have good intent, and I won't name uh, one that I'm quite disappointed in that started as a vegan organization and is very successful today, uh, when it goes on the stock market, and, you know, the corporation becomes a person and the entire objective is to make profits, they lose their way sometimes. So just because somebody has a good brand name now doesn't mean it will be two years from now. Let's hope it's 20 or 30 years from now that we can trust that brand name. And all of us have room to improve. Me, you, all of us have room to improve. But knowledge and education, knowledge and education, knowledge and education. And today, uh, you cannot trust news in most parts of the world. News is controlled by the corporate interest, but you can trust many of the documentaries. And so I watch my children uh, who are everywhere from their late teens to their 30s now, they get a lot of their information from that. And they are pretty acutely knowledgeable about how to cherry pick from the internet. Most of the nonsense you see on the internet is baloney too. But the truth is, they know how to cherry pick what's true and what's not true. 